uh, people who signed up who maybe couldn't be here, but also they get posted online um, so that you can share to all of your friends and families if you enjoyed tonight's presentation. Um, so welcome everyone to our April Learn, Discover, Grow virtual event. Uh, my name is Patrick Burnham. You're gonna hear a lot from me tonight. I am the Educational Programs Coordinator for the Herringut Coastal Science Center. Before we begin, I want to give a wonderful thank you to tonight's sponsor for our event, which is uh, Wendy Makins. So thank you very much. A little silent round of applause for everyone. Um, thank you so much for supporting Herring Gut. And if anyone here tonight is interested and enjoyed tonight's event and would like to be a future sponsors, please let us know and uh, reach out. Um, because our time this evening is spent talking about the amazing natural resources that Maine has to offer, I want to begin our time with an acknowledgement honoring all Indigenous people. We wish to acknowledge the spiritual and physical connections the Abenaki and Wabanaki peoples have maintained to the land, which is Aki, in water, which is Nebi. Here in Gut Coastal Science Center and our work exists within this uh, Aki land and Nebi water, this unceded territory of the Wabanaki homeland. It is our responsibility to foster relationships and opportunities that strengthen the well being of the indigenous people who carry forward the traditions of their ancestors. Um, we love to offer these virtual events, like I said, in this collaborative way. Uh, because of this, we'd like to ask everyone to make sure that they're muted um, to re reduce competing voices and noises at the end of the presentation and at specific times we'll, you can you know, unmute yourselves and ask any questions. Um, you can put your video on, anything like that. If you'd like to ask a question, um, you can also chat or type it into the chat and I'll be looking at those questions and compiling them. Um, to the end or bringing them up as we see fit. Before I introduce our speakers and kind of go down uh, the, the plan for tonight, excuse me, I want to note that Herring Gut Coastal Science Center is a nonprofit organization that is supported by donations and gifts from the public like yourselves. Through your generosity, we are able to provide programs like this one we are bringing you tonight. Uh, if you like our event tonight uh, and you have the means, we would greatly appreciate your support. You can find the donation link on our website, but also we'll put it in the chat at the end of the presentation. So our goal for tonight is to talk about seaweed. It is uh, a really fun, amazing, incredible thing that not everyone likes to talk about all the time and you know it is also seaweed week in Maine um, and it's a really exciting time. We're going to start off watching a short nine minute film called Ocean Greens that talks about seaweed and farming seaweed and using seaweed and all of its great um, uses. And then after that, we are going to uh, bring in our guest panelists, our wonderful speakers tonight, and how they use seaweeds from Maine in their local businesses. So I'm so very happy to have joining us tonight, uh, Allison Lakin from uh, Lakin George's Cheese and East 40 Farm in Walderboro. Thank you, Allison. Um, I have uh, Gabriella and... Um, Derek from Wolf Peach, they're up there. Thank you so much. Um, and we also have uh, Greg here from uh, Causeway Restaurant in Spruce Head. I forgot to mention Wolf Peach is up in Camden, so sorry. Um, and Greg is again from Causeway Restaurant in Spruce Head. So thank you all to our panelists for joining us. We're gonna hear from them a little bit later once we have a chance to um, watch our film. So, <clears throat> Excuse me. I am going to get our film ready. Some of you may have seen um, the film already. We did encourage or have the link out to the film earlier in case you wanted to watch the film ahead of time. I'm going to share my screen and pull it up right now. This is a really wonderful film. Um, and I have to put in a small little plug for um, 
the water bear network if you are a person who really enjoys documentaries um or any type of informative um video journalism anything like that water bear is a free online documentary um source so all the documentaries on the website are completely free you can just sign up for free they're on there they're really great and you get really cool gems like this one which is really exciting so before we begin i do want to say that uh, ocean greens does take place along the united kingdom's coastline so even though it doesn't take place directly in main waters it has a lot of very similar um, environments habitats and seaweeds that we have here it just does a really great job of um, showcasing uh, how important seaweed is and how seaweed can be used. So we're going to get right in it. It's about nine minutes long, and I hope you all enjoy. We're just destroying the planet, what we live on. We need to find solutions to counteract that destruction that we're causing. We know the damaging effects of industrialized food systems. People are starting to look for a solution. Hunter gatherers and Neolithic people would probably have foraged on bits of seaweed from the rocky shore. knowing it. It's one of the fastest growing crops, has huge productivity compared to terrestrial plants, uh, with some species growing up to 10 centimetres a day. Probably about nine months old, yeah. um, but it will be growing quite quickly at this time. Of Sorry everyone, I think I muted myself and which muted the movie, so I'm just going to back it up just a little bit. Good old technical zoom things can everyone hear me now okay great i'm just gonna go with it i'm gonna put play here sorry about that seaweeds are extremely diverse seaweed is in a lot of different products that people might not realize they've eaten it's in beer it's in toothpaste it's in ice cream extract of seaweed act as a, a gelling or a thickening agent so a lot of people might have eaten seaweed without knowing it it's one of the fastest growing crops, has huge productivity compared to terrestrial plants, uh, with some species growing up to 10 centimetres a day. Probably about nine months old, yeah. um, but it will be growing quite quickly at this time of year. The seaweed farming industry in the UK is only recently starting to emerge. The market's been dominated by Asia, but we're seeing it popping up all over the place. By 2050, we're going to have to provide about 70% more food than we are currently. So we're going to have to turn to yeah, sea-based sources and, and make sure they're sustainable. We harvest and process a variety of organic Cornish seaweeds as a superfood, really, and cooking ingredient in delis and to health food shops and to chefs and restaurants. I've got two favourite seaweeds to eat. One is dulse. It's this red seaweed, quite thin. People liken it to bacon. Very Moorish, salty taste. The other one is sea spaghetti. When it's quite young, it's very tender and it's almost like asparagus. The ranges of seaweeds are just incredible. You can do such different things with them when you're cooking. started the first two years that we were working we were going around doing all our own you know i was cycling around london 
and Bristol and going to every restaurant and trying to arrange meetings with every chef and nobody was really interested. We were so broken by that stage, like having, we both had moved into caravans and we were living off like 50 pounds a week, absolutely nothing and just doing this all the time and not making any money at all. People starting to know more and more that seaweed is this incredible thing that's very healthy and very good for you. It's not a plant, it doesn't have roots. It takes its nutrients straight through its leaves. So it's a very basic plant. The demand is growing every year. We can't get enough seaweed at the moment. Whatever we harvest today will be sold tomorrow. Seaweed absolutely meets the future food needs of a massive global population. All the research that's been done is that people are driven towards seaweed because of its healthiness and its sustainability. Those are the big drivers. It can have a really positive impact on climate change because it's a huge carbon sink, absorbs a lot of carbon as it grows, it doesn't need land, doesn't need fresh water, doesn't need fertilizer, which are some of the big issues with terrestrial farming. At first glance, seaweed is just this slimy, almost disgusting thing that wraps around your leg when you're trying to surf. I think that's one of the things that I love about it because it's just totally misunderstood. Seaweed is higher in vitamins and minerals than any other food class. When you cook with it in something like a stew, it forms a gelatinous like gel, and that is really soothing and very anti-inflammatory for the digestive tract. There was some research done that seaweed was something that we started to eat as we hunter-gatherers, we moved more towards the coast, and all the nutrients in the seaweed and seafood we started to eat probably led to the evolution of the modern human brain. At the moment in the UK, it's an undertapped resource, so why not utilise that? 95% of global seaweed production, which is about 32 million tonnes, all comes from Asia and is based on a model with really cheap labour. So how to upscale in a way that's um, economically efficient is one of the key challenges. It's still very small scale, it's a very niche product, which means that the price is relatively high. In order to get it into the supermarkets, the price needs to come down a bit and availability needs to just increase, but also people need to be more aware of what they can do with it and how to use it. I think those are, those are the barriers really. So we only take up to half a plant so that they can regrow and regenerate and cut everything with scissors so everything can just grow back again. As a growing business, it would be, you know, you imagine that you would want to just expand and sell more seaweed, but we wouldn't want to take any more from the natural environment than we do at the moment. So we've grown every year so much that we're really, we can't take any more and we wouldn't want to take any more before it started negatively impacting our local environment. Growing sustainably is the most important thing for us. With climate change, no one knows what's going to happen. So we've now started farming seaweed as well, and that's where the future lies. We're not going to compete with the Asian markets on cost. What we need to look at is these higher value markets, whether that be in food or nutrition or nutraceutical, pharmaceutical, biomedical, biomaterials, biofuels, you know, seaweed really just ticks every box, which is why it's such an exciting industry. It's also got lots of applications for animal feed. There's extracts of seaweed used to reduce methane emissions in cows. It can provide a marine habitat for marine wildlife and it can help to offset many of the harmful or damaging effects of industrialised food systems. We just want everybody to think of seaweed as a normal staple food. That will be success because that means seaweed is really back where it should be as an everyday food. I love seaweed. It's just such a phenomenal thing. We can save the world with seaweed. Everyone can have enough food to eat by using it.
like every time you hear something in, in the news about it, it's like, yeah, of course Siri can do that. Siri can do everything. Okay. I think I turned it off. Can everyone hear me again? Yes. Wonderful. Great. Um, so that was our really cool, amazing um, film about uh, seaweed. And um, it definitely highlighted a lot of really important, important, amazing things about seaweed and how, you know, just a few years ago, seaweed was thought about as something that was, um, uh, you know, gross, and I didn't want it to touch my feet when I went for a swim, or it was really gross um, in the water. And when people normally talk about like algae, they kind of think about the green slime that covers the, you know, a pond or a pool or something like that. Um, but what's really interesting is when what we call as seaweeds is actually a group of animals called the algae, or a group of organisms called algae. They're not animals. They're not plants. They're not animals. They are an algae um, species, which is really cool. They're not plants because they don't have traditional um, structures like leaves or a trunk or roots or anything like that. They have blades, which are their leaves, a stipe, which is their trunk, um, and hold fast, which are their, their roots, which don't actually bury into anything. They just kind of hold on top of things. Um, and like the person in the film said, they absorb all of their nutrients that they need through every part of their body, just sitting in water. They don't have to just have roots that are absorbing water when they're watered. It is, they're getting everything from their um, regular body, which is so cool. So algaes are our seaweeds. We just use the common word as seaweeds. I did have someone... Um, in the message here say, are there any concerns regarding to pollutants in seaweeds absorbing them? Um, there aren't um, a lot of concerns with that right now. Obviously, we want the seaweeds to grow in the most healthy and beautiful and amazing waters that they can be in. Um, and we don't necessarily want to harvest seaweeds that are in places with high amounts of pollutants. Um, they do themselves a really good job of filtering out and making sure that they're only absorbing the things that they need. But if they're covered in oil or, you know, any type of other chemical, it is going to stick to them and can hinder their health. So it is a little tricky in that when we go out and harvest seaweed or we grow seaweed, we want to make sure that it's in a clean space in a water that is clean and it is ocean water um, that has a lot of movement so it can move any pollutants out of the way. But I think it's more of a aesthetic pleasing like, ooh, was that from the place that just had a giant oil spill? Or, you know, it doesn't always necessarily affect their being and then what we eat. So it's a great question. Um, wonderful. What I would love to do now is 
Well, I wish I could find my slideshow. There it is. Okay. What I would love to do now is have our um, panelists kind of um, have their videos on. Um, oh, Nicole, also before I get um, into that, are there any commercial farming aquaculture of seaweed locally? Yes, there are. There are lots of local seaweed. Um, first of all, harvesting, even though some harvesting of seaweed just got a little bit more difficult for our um, friends who go out and harvest with some local, um, some recent main Supreme Court rulings um, for things that prevent harvesters from collecting in the intertidal area without getting permission from homeowners. So it really severely limits the place where they can actually go and harvest. And most of the time, the seaweed that they're harvesting on is on rocks that are completely submerged by water during the tide. So that's really tricky. Um, but there are some farms around here that do harvest um, seaweed. I know that there's a farm, um, I believe in, you know, Spruce Head area or on the St. George Peninsula. Um, there are some other Wheeler Bay is another one. Sally is helping me out here with remembering locations. Um, there are some farms that are a little bit further north. Um, a Bar Harbor, Stonington um, area is a real hub for a lot of algae that's being grown. Casco Bay is also a little bit south of us, is a really big hub for a lot of them. I know that Atlantic Sea Farms uh, partners with a lot of different places up and down the peninsula uh, or up and down the coast with um, certain farmers. And I'm sure um, I'm hearing Gabriella seeing her shake her head yes and stuff. So they might actually have some insights into where they get some of their seaweed from. So with that, I'm going to jump right in and have, you know, our guests here. Um, what we can do is I have a slideshow that we can go through once we start talking. Um, I can maybe highlight uh, your business's um, seaweed week meals that you have, you know, ready. And so we'll get to that. But, you know, how did you all feel about the film and what you watched? Um, does anyone want to go first and kind of voice as a business owner what they took away from that film? Yeah, go for it. Um, Derek and Gabriella. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think full disclosure for me personally, the the eating of seaweed outside of you know particular genres of food is is very new, and it's really exciting. Um, I think both on a personal level and then of course as a business owner, um, our whole mission is hyper focused on the Northeast. So we're really trying to force ourselves to or challenge ourselves to um, lean into things that we otherwise would probably overlook if we were using, you know, imported ingredients um, from other places. And that's been a lot of fun, but we're, you know, it's all a learning curve. Um, and so watching something like that, like the sheer number of species, you know, the 600 species around the UK, that's um, incredible and amazing. Um, and then also kind of watching the different ways that they were preparing the, the food in, you know, just kind of in those quick cuts that they did when they were, when they were cooking, um, you know, for me personally, at least that's all still new. So I was like, oh, like, oh, they tried that one. Oh, I see they were using that one in a <laughs> stew or that one into the burger. <clears throat> you know, and like wanting to understand why certain things would go into, you know, particular recipes, but it's, it's just really exciting, you know, and I think being on the, on the beginning of it, um, but watching that and watching how quickly it's grown and the reception is really comforting because it feels like this isn't a fad. It feels like this is where we want to be investing our attention. Um, so that's really exciting. That is really exciting. One of the uh, interesting things for me is that she she mentioned that 90% of the, the seaweed harvested globally still comes from Asia. And I would have thought that number was was a bit lower after, uh, you know, the growth here in, in 
right. in the U.S. the last probably five or ten years. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, I guess we we have to think about it too in ways of they're eating that seaweed in a little bit more regularly than you know we are. So there is, and there's you know uh, the populations over there that are eating the sushi or the um you know the seaweed flakes and stuff like that that is more of a constant in their diet they're definitely um you know being able to produce and you know harvest a lot more to um you know make up for the people who are using it um which is really exciting and like you said um it is it's we are making record numbers every single year in the state of Maine, the harvest and of our foraged seaweed, but also um, farm seaweed is like off the charts from what it was two, three years ago. You know, Atlantic Sea Farms was, you know, they, they pulled a lot of seaweed for, you know, US standards in three years ago, but then last year they pulled you know an astronomical amount of seaweed compared to what they were doing you know even just three years ago so it is it is interesting and it is going up and it is nice to see so um allison what about your reactions your thoughts well i really don't understand why people keep referring to seaweed as being gross because i think it's sexy you know it's (laughs) It's architectural. It dances when it's underwater and when it's when it's on on exposed on the beach. When when the tide has gone out, you can see such great you know great structures and you see the crabs going in amongst it. And it's just, I mean, it's it's exhilarating to consider what the possibilities are with seaweed. And and when I the, the reason that I'm now making uh, for those of you who don't know me, <laughs> I'm, I'm the owner of Lake and Gorgeous Cheese, and I make a cheese that's it behind me, um, which has a layer of dried bladder rack seaweed in it. And I started making that cheese because I relocated my business uh, to this beautiful 1700 <coughs> farm in Alderboro, which stretches down to the Madamic River. And I always like to say that we have a working waterfront here because when the tide goes out in Long Cove, we've got a quarter mile of exposed clam flats. And at any time, there's between six and 10 clamors out there working. Uh, and, and it's so great to have this living cove attached to the farm. And when I wanted to consider creating a cheese that was a taste of this place, I didn't draw it from the land, I drew it from the sea. So very often I referred to the, the you, I use the, the aquaculture term of meroir, which is referring to the, the flavor of the sea. And, and that's that's being captured in this, in this cheese. Um, and, and when I made it, I'm actually gonna reach over here for something to show you. Um, when I started doing re- research and development, I contacted uh, Maine Coast Sea Vegetables and, and they very nicely sent me this, this uh, assortment pack of different types of seaweeds and I went through and I tasted them all raw to see what their flavor profiles were and then started working on developing a cheese. I spent six months doing it before I came up with this. But I find that that the average person that I encounter, their, their most frequent experience eating seaweed is a, a, as nori. Um, you know, so the dried, very, very salt forward, intensely ocean flavored, um, Dry, dry that with sushi and and some people find that an off-putting taste and so if, if somebody says oh well that has seaweed and it, it's going to be really strong but that's one of the amazing things about about the seaweeds because every variety has a different flavor and if you dry it or flake it or keep it uh, intact it also is going to have a different flavor so even within one seaweed variety depending on how you handle it it's going to have work differently as an ingredient absolutely um when heron gut uh coastal science center takes a lot of groups tide pooling and down into the intertidal all the time and i always find it fascinating when we go down there because or into that area uh with those groups because i'm always 
you know, everyone is like turning over bigger rocks and looking for the bigger animals. And I'm like, let's look at what color seaweed I can find today. And let's look at what tiny little thing. And I always like to look for those seaweeds because it's really fun to also just like be like, hey, everyone, look at this and just take a bunch of seaweed and just like take a huge mouthful of it <laughs> and just eat it in front of people. And people are like, what are you doing? Um, and you know, you can find dulse um, on this coast, Irish moss, which is a great red al um, algae that is um, a little bit tougher when it's in its raw form, um, but still not as salty as like you would find, um, you know, from a packet that of nori that you would get anywhere. And it has Probably a nice- is use make Irish moss blanc mange, which is so good. Oh, that does sound really good. And um, I've mixed it in with chocolate before, or there's a recipe you mix it in with chocolate. It uh, really helps add a lot of really amazing flavor. Um, another milder algae that you can find on the beach um, is a green algae called ova or sea lettuce. It's probably one of the easiest ones to see. And it's thin sheets that kind of have ruffles, kind of like a lettuce leaf. And that one is really great to eat. Um, it has a lot of nice salty flavor because, you know, the ocean um, as it's raw, but it's not overly chewy or anything like that. But then you can get into some more of the complex brown algae, which are our bladder racks, our ascophyllums, the rock weeds, all of those, which are you know, you can eat almost every algae, almost every seaweed you can you know, eat. Um, but some obviously taste better than others, which is really fun. Um, so it's kind of fun to take kids or groups out and tell people that. And then you just see which ones people are eating and things like that. So that's exciting. Um, okay. So now that we kind of have those reactions um, from our film, why don't we go around again and talk about what, and you all may kind of touched on this a little bit, what has been some of your inspiration as to why bring seaweed into your kitchens um, and why try to work with something that is almost sometimes when people um, look at it like, oh, that's cool, a seaweed, whatever, seaweed this or seaweed that, like what, how do you get over, I guess this is a two-part question. What was your inspiration to bring seaweed into your kitchen? And then what gets you to continually put seaweed on your menus um, for people to come back to? And do you see people coming back to it? I don't know who would like to start. I don't think we heard from Craig there, did we? But Greg did, yeah, great. Go for it, Greg. Thanks, Allison. Um, yeah, so I actually, we bought the, the Craig Nair Inn and, and uh, newly renamed Causeway Restaurant uh, a little over three years ago. And shortly after that time, we went to a, a local St. George Business Alliance meeting, uh, which I'm now on the board for, but that was pre-COVID times. And we were doing kind of monthly in-person meetings where they would have a speaker series um, similar to this, but in person. And so the the first one we went to happened to be with, uh, I think, Bree and someone else from, there was a couple of um, women there from Atlantic Sea Farms, um, kind of telling us about, about their products and what they do. And uh, so we kind of immediately started adding that to, to our restaurant um, in the form of kind of a, a seaweed green salad um, with some homemade um, ginger soy dressing that is probably our most selling, most popular salad on the menu. Um, so everybody really likes that. Um, we also use use some different seaweed where I self harvest and um, you know got got our permit so I can go down and harvest I think up to fifty pounds of seaweed a week for for ourselves and and the restaurant here, um, which is way more than we use. Uh, we everybody really likes the presentation that with our oysters um, that are a couple of different locally grown uh, oysters from the West Key River here, different spots and and down in Dermascada. Uh, so that's a lot of fun. Uh, really, just kind of gives you a different, different presentation and different look. And uh, I would say that 
a lot of people are surprised when they order a salad and, and kind of see it um, because it doesn't look like the seaweed that you get from the, the Japanese or Thai restaurants. It's that bright neon green that's frozen and dyed over in Asia and then makes its way over here. Um, but 90, I'd say 90, 95% of the people really enjoy it. Um, there are a few that, that find it to be a little too earthy, a little too strong. Um, but yeah, we've had, had pretty good luck with that. And then uh, this past week being seaweed week, we had some really nice specials. Uh, we did uh, with uh, Baron's sugar kelp uh, vodka. We made uh, a little Collins with some fresh squeezed lemon and lime juice with the seaweed shaken with a little bit of um, seaweed strands in it as well for the, um, that look nice in the, in the presentation. Uh, we did have the Urban Farm Seaweed Cider um, that, that also got mixed reviews. Uh, <laughs> and we actually, we did some, uh, our, our, our sous chef Meg uh, put together some really nice bulgogi uh, sliders with a kimchi, uh, a seaweed kimchi uh, that everybody absolutely loved. Um, so that was, that was a lot of fun to let them experiment with a couple of different things and see what they wanted to, to serve out of the kitchen for the week. It's really cool. I really love seaweed kimchi and where I'm going to share all of these pictures of all these things that we're talking about um, a little bit once we, you know, get through some of the talking, I am going to share some of these pictures and everyone will be able to see and have the mouth wateringness that is happening here. So um, great. Thank you, Greg, for that. That's awesome. And then... Okay. Um... Yeah, uh, well, I, I've always used seaweed in my cooking, but it's usually been like kombu bought from from Japan or something like that. Um, so being here, and Allison touched on it, like the meroir of the area. If you like, if, for me, thinking about the main coast and like from a food aspect of what it like what it feels like to be on the main coast, it's the smell of seaweed and the ocean. Um, so I've always wanted to have that on our menu as a sense of place for, for where we are. Um, and we're, for Seaweed Week, we've been, we, we have seaweed on our menu anyway. We mix it into our butter and we let that culture. Um, we've been making with seaweed with our, yeah, with our sourdough. Um, yeah. We've been making seaweed vinegar. So we basically make a, a seaweed broth um, and then add in a neutral spirit and turn that into vinegar. So we're serving that now uh, with our also West Geek oysters, um, with as our oysters net. as a mini net uh, with some chopped up pickled seaweed in it, which is Ooh. really great. Um, another cool thing that I kind of discovered last weekend, um, or usually if you're making like a adding something into a puree to keep it stable. Um, I always use like xanthan gum or something like that. Um, and this week I, we had Irish moss. So I just threw that in with blanch turnip tops and then did the normal emulsification without the xanth xanthan gum and it, it held together. It's beautiful. Better than xanthan oh. gum would have. Um, I could just rip boil it and it would just keep an emulsification. It was great and bright green. It was really cool. And there's some other, we have like seaweed salsa verde on right now and some other. With, that's crispy potatoes are just kind of tossed in a seaweed yeah. and parsley salsa verde. And um, we stole some of the, the pickled seaweed to add into a um, kind of riff on a martini. So similar uh, to what Greg was saying, we use the Baron sugar kelp vodka, which I think is spectacular. And I'm not really a vodka drinker and very, it's the first good. vodka I've ever tried that I was like oh I would actually just drink this neat you know chilled it's it's really delicious um I haven't heard of this one it's what really is great yeah so Blue Baron Distillery which is based here in Camden um and actually the the person who owns it um it ran a restaurant uh, which was the Druthy Bear um which is where Wolf Beach is so we we have this relationship with Andrew and we have you know been using his spirits um since the beginning and his production is just wonderful across the board and he uses a lot of intentionally foraged ingredients there including seaweed there we go yay it's so good it's so there. good that's awesome yeah I just found it here as well on my page so that's yeah. so fascinating 
And shout out to Blue Bear and they're opening a wonderful distillery space and restaurant this coming summer, just across the harbor in, um, in Camden. So everybody keep a lookout for that. But yeah, we don't, you know, so we don't use lemon or lime. So we use the pickled kelp at, to kind of add that, you know, kind of a riff on a dirty martini um, oh. with, with that vodka. And it's, you know, it's definitely a challenge for people, but, you know, we try to kind of give that caveat if people are drawn to it. Um, and the people who love it, love it. And that's a lot of fun. Um, you know, but I'm certainly inspired by trying to think about also how do we draw out other flavors? So a friend of mine who's a forager took me out and was just kind of showing me different things and having me smell and taste. And there's a, a small algae that grows on top of another longer seaweed. Um, and I don't know the scientific name, but it, it's sea truffle and it literally smells and tastes like uh, a truffle from Italy. And it just has this blooming savory oh. quality that's wild. And it reminds me, I once, um, at a restaurant, one of the dessert courses was a very um, fine seaweed that kind of looked like a little poof ball and that had been dipped in a chocolate and then allowed to dry. And because of the, the kind of network of tendrils, it ended up holding air in the chocolate. So when you bit into it, it had that texture of like, um, like an arrow bar, which is a, a European chocolate that kind of you, you crunch it and it's just, it's really, it's a pleasant experience, but then you also get this really savory quality from the seaweed against the chocolate. So I've been kind of trying to think about how do we, how do we reimagine that, you know, with, with some other different sweeter ingredients that are main based um, to make a dessert. So, you know, it's a lot of just excitement at this point for me. I think you've been working with seaweed a lot longer than I have. So I'm just in discovery mode. Yeah, we're, we're just kind of letting um, our team go for it yeah we have, um, someone who act, he actually worked at a, a seaweed fertilizing company and um, that's his background and like that that kind of world so he's doing a lot of our fermentation and you know so he's he like makes a lot of our vinegars and he just brings me things that are incredibly creative that's yeah really fascinating um i i love the the, the chocolate one um Sounds like it was a sea potato. Its common name is, it looks like a little potato um, mm. in its a form. You can find them on beaches. They just look like little sacks and sometimes there's water, air bubbles in them. Okay. Um, so that might be that one. I'm yeah. really interested. I think I have an image of the, the truffle-like I can one. find, I found it recently. So let me just quickly okay. look on my phone and I can find the oh. scientific name. I should have had that ready. No, that's good. Cause that, that is something, you know, I don't know all of the things I enjoy seaweed. I love teaching about seaweeds. Um, but adding the extra spin of, wow, this could be really cool in this meal, or you could, you know, besides just eating it raw, like as an educator, adding that extra layer of, you know, things on to the, um, you know, my knowledge and what I can communicate out to people is also, really cool and something new to um to put on there so i'll text you the link to this but it's called so it's called norwegian sea truffle and it's called vertebrata lanosa and it's this i don't know if this is going to translate very well on the screen but it it just is like this poofy beautiful i don't know if you can see that really it's just i'll send you the link but it's Delicious. That's fascinating. So Allison, what about yourself? How are, you know, you kind of did talk about a little bit, but do you have, do you have plans to expand your seaweed cheese endeavors? Um, Oddly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I have an idea. Um, I, I will say that that um, I'm, I have been blessed since winning the gold medal um, with for, in the World Championship Cheese Contest with my cheese. That suddenly, thank you. <laughs> suddenly, um, uh, business is really brisk, and I, I've had to quadruple the amount of the rockweed uh, that I'm making. And 
Um, so, so it's, it's sort of changed my relationship to my cheese making in general. So this isn't really a good time to add a cheese, but I have a really good idea for a cheese. So I'm not going to tell you what it is yet because I'm still, I'm still in the R and D phase, but it looks spectacular. I mean, it tastes great, obviously, but it looks spectacular. Uh, so I'm, I'm, so be, stay tuned for that. <laughs> if you ever need a, um, you know, a beta tester, my taste buds are here for you. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, uh, Greg was mentioning that he, he got a license to be able to, to harvest seaweed. And I, I would really like to be able to, to, to learn how, how to, how to harvest the seaweed. Now I have been yelled at by certain scientists who say you call the cheese rockweed, but it has bladder rack in it. But we all know that it sounds a lot better to eat a rock than to eat a bladder. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but that, that is the one thing. I would really like to do is, is because I, I have at the end of my property um, a lot of, of seaweed and and also as an aside to going back to to what they were saying in the film uh, we do feed, feed our cows kelp uh, and and also when we have time and can take the sleds down to to the to the shore um, we'll, we'll gather up seaweeds that have have washed up and and bring them up and give them to them as well and they eat it like candy that is wonderful. So you brought up a really great point um, in something that they, they did talk about in the film, I think briefly, is seaweed is being um, pursued as this kind of a miracle. I wish we could grow it fast enough. Um, way to feed livestock and large numbers of livestock in that it is more nutritious than um, just corn, which is what most of larger, you know, livestock is fed. Um, and especially for cows, it significantly reduces the amount of, well, gas that the cow has. Um, cows are notorious producers of methane um, gas, which is a greenhouse gas that is 30 times more potent, stronger than uh, carbon dioxide. So it has ability to be a lot more of a significant impact to our warming climate. And with cattle production, the way that it is, especially in the United States, the amount of methane that comes from cows is intensive. And there's a lot of projects going on trying to capture the methane from the cows and things like that. But feeding them seaweed is can reduce the amount of uh, farts essentially that these cows have. And it's a really great way to help um, the whole situation, which is fascinating. Um, they also did mention in the, um, the video how fast seaweed can grow in certain, um, especially kelp species can grow um, I know for giant kelp, which is a West Coast species, um, where you see like the giant kelp forests that are 60, 40 feet tall's worth of these beautiful kelps, they can grow like three feet in a day in the right conditions. Like these are plant or uh, algaes that are growing significantly fast inside of um, their right nutrient contents. That doesn't happen for every species always, um, but they do grow significantly faster than sometimes um, a lot of our land-based crops that we use for things. So that's really fascinating as well. Um, great. I, feel I, I, oh. I defend my cows. My cows don't eat corn. My cows are grass-fed. They eat grass and they eat hay and they eat seaweed. Great. <laughs> I, I was wondering, I didn't want to, you know, I, as I said it, I was like, oh, I hope she, you know, I, I had a feeling. So I'm glad that you said something too. Um, and I was going to mention something else. Ooh, really quickly back to that Norwegian um, um, truffle, sea truffle is exactly the species that I had thought of. I saw a lot of it the other day at, um, 
uh, an event we did at Ash Point Preserve with George's River Land Trust. And people were like, why is this, what is this seaweed growing in other ones? And we figured out what species it was, but I didn't know how cool or important it was. So that's really fascinating. Um, I just wanted to loop back around to one of the questions that Nicole had, had put in um, yeah. about the, the kind of pollutants. And, you know, I, I obviously am not speaking from the perspective of knowing a lot about seaweed and the way seaweed, you know, I know seaweed is a carbon capture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, but I think one thing that we hear a lot in these conversations around like changing our approach. So whether it's, you know, starting to eat more seaweed or going to solar power, going to electric, you know, I feel like there's all these conversations and questions around the potential negative impacts that come from these things and fixating on that. And, you know, the reality is right now we're eating terrestrial plants that are getting covered in chemicals and sucking up, you know, landlocked, you know, groundwater that is full of pollutants. And so, you know, that that's our foundation that we're starting from. So any, anything moving away from that is going to be positive. So even the idea that some seaweed might have some level of contamination, the fact that we know that it captures these things and holds them and then doesn't transfer them when you ingest it, compared to say, you know, the, the crisis that we're experiencing in Maine right now with like PFAS chemicals, getting into groundwater and also getting into feed and then getting into animals, um, you know, and we know we can see that that tracks around, um, you know, I think that it's really important to kind of remember that we're not starting from a place of perfection. We're starting from a place of pretty intense contamination and that this is a better, a better direction to go in uh, regardless of, um, you know, the idea that yes, there is an oil spill that happens. Yeah, that was just one thought. One thought, that's great, great thoughts. Um, I would like to, I know we're, we're 755-ish. Um, I want to be able to ask questions or have anyone who has questions to ask them, but I do want to share all of your pictures first that you all sent me because I want our our wonderful guests to um, to see them. So I am going to share my screen. And um, when you see your picture come up, just go ahead and talk about it. I think it's, we're starting with Allison and then we're going to... Greg, and then we're going to Wolf Peach. So that's going to be our order there. All right. Share. And, you know, you can go ahead and just talk about it, whatever you see, you know, maybe some thoughts on your certain pieces or whatever. I know we've kind of talked about this, but um, again, I want everyone to be able to see what we're talking about. Oh, I don't want share. I want you to slideshow. There it is. So on the on the left is the come hither look from the rockweed um, at its its perfect ripe ripeness when it's got a lovely cream line and that beautiful green that comes through from the seaweed. And on the right is um, at at slack tide down here at at Long Cove, and that's what I'm looking at. And that was that was the inspiration behind creating this cheese. Yes, the, the sexy seaweed, which is going to stay with me for a while now, which is great. Could you tell us a little bit more about maybe like what flavor profiles or is it a soft cheese, hard cheese? Sure. Do you eat the rind, you know, for any uh, of us who are novices on cheese? It's not me, but for anyone who's there. <laughs> yeah, so this is in the category of cheeses known as a bloomy rind cheese. So that means that it's a cousin to things like green camembert. So when you're looking at the rind, the, the, the white fuzz that's on the outside, is definitely edible. Um, the, what the, ideally, the slice of cheese with an edible rind is is basically a sandwich of, of the exterior rind and the paste going toward the center of the cheese. And that that is what the full flavor of the cheese should be. And you also um, want to eat it at room temperature because fats um, don't really re start to release all of their good flavors until they're warmer. So the flavor profile of this cheese is creamy and briny. And, and so when I say briny, uh, that is in contrast to say like a potato chip salt. So it's just sort of like this gentle, 
you know, the, the, what I, I like to, what a customer of mine described to me once says as um, when you're, when you're standing at the shore and you get that initial beautiful aroma of the sea, and this is how you eat it. I love that so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Um, next, I think Greg. So these are our, <clears throat> our Aphrodite oysters uh, from Spruce Head up here from South Thomaston. Uh, served on a, a bed of um, seaweed that I've harvested out here. It's beautiful. And then? And then the, the seaweed mixed green salad uh, with the, the soy ginger uh, glaze there. It looks delicious. And then these are just uh, obviously not a professional photo like the other ones I took uh, this weekend with the, uh, the sugar kelp collins, uh, the seaweed kimchi uh, sliders there and the, the cider, um, seaweed cider, and then our seaweed salad off to the, the side there a little bit. Wonderful. How long are um, the, these, the specials, the sliders gonna be um, available with you all, Greg? So we actually just um, just closed down this week for about a, a week so I can um, tear down a couple of walls in the restaurant here and, and make a big mess of things. Um, so we we didn't, I think we participated in the first three days of the seaweed week and not the full uh, second half into next week. Got it. Well, cool. I, I'll just have to wait for next seaweed week to get the kimchi <laughs> sliders for sure because those look absolutely bomb. Wonderful. Um, so that, that's our menu for seaweed week and we put little squiggles by the things that had seaweed in them. Um, the turnips actually also had the, that was what I was talking about with the Irish moss. So that actually does have seaweed, but we didn't mark it. Whoops, sorry guys. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's our, our sourdough that I bake and there's the butter down there that has, um, and that's Atlantic Sea Farms um, kelp that we, we can buy um, through native Maine wholesale they send like big frozen blocks of it all chopped up that's really cool yeah um and those are just our oysters um not pictured is the seaweed mini net but those are uh west Gag oysters and um one of one of the cooler things we had uh this is a um eel from american unagi and pig head terrine from, yeah, the pig is from Broad Arrow Farm on uh, the Pemaquip Peninsula. So there's, um, yeah, there's smoked eel in there that we smoke here, uh, the, the pig head, uh, some carrots, and then there's uh, kelp in there as well. So that helped, you know, I mean, the, the pig head has plenty of gelatin to set it, but the kelp, I guess, maybe helped a little bit. And you so, can taste it. I mean, yeah, it really, you can really yeah. taste the seaweed in the- yeah. It's so nice. That's I funny. feel like and it's a taurine, you said. So is that just like you serve with crackers or our bread? Yeah. Our bread. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, that sourdough looks amazing um, as well. Um, oh, did we lose you? Nope. Nope. Over here. There we go. We just were waiting for the next yeah. picture. And those are just um just fried potatoes with tossed in seaweed salsa verde so nice simple but i mean del delicious they're fried potatoes so that looks amazing i think that's all of the pictures that i have i hope everyone's mouth is watering now um <laughs> because absolutely stunning work by everyone so thank you all so much for sharing those. I know we're over our time just a hair, but is there anyone out there who would love to ask a question to our wonderful business owners and panels here tonight about seaweed or what they make or anything like that? Please feel free to unmute or type it in so we can get some questions in. Go for it, anyone. I think our, everyone's too busy with their grumbling stomachs. Um, so uh, at least I am. I can't wait to, to come and visit all of you all. Um, you know, I might not be able to get there for Seaweed Week, but all of your, your restaurants look amazing. Your work looks amazing. Um, so thank you all so much for sharing. Um, and thank you all for coming tonight. 
Um, I do want to say before we end officially that in the chat right now is our link to our website for donations. If you enjoyed the talk tonight, please, um, you know, consider donating. Um, also consider sponsoring um, one of these events in the future. We can work with you what topic and things like that, which is really exciting. Our, speaking of which, our next topic uh, for May, um, which is the last Tuesday, not the last Tuesday, because it's right after Memorial Day, um, but it is May 24th at 7 p.m. We're talking with um, Phoebe from Hurricane Island, Phoebe Jeklik. She's um, the lead scientist out there who does shellfish aquaculture, and we're, she's kind of helping us um, with curating some wonderful, another panel with local scientists and farmers. And the theme is talking about how scientists and farmers are working together in the shellfish industry to have it bloom here in the state, which is really exciting. And then lastly, I wanna do talk about our June Learn, Discover, Grow. We're doing a little spin on the shellfish aquaculture and we're talking um, about shell middens if you don't know what shell middens are, they're really phenomenal um, ancient relics of um, past Wabanaki peoples who used to live in the state and eat and work with shellfish. And when they would discard them in piles, they um, grew into these massive piles called middens. And we're going to talk about the history of middens why they're important um, for understanding native cultures, but how we can use them to kind of be like, wow, we're having this resurgence of shellfish aquaculture here in the state, and they did it way back then too. Um, so it's going to be really exciting, and that's in June. So we hope that you will join us for both of those. They'll be on our website, and we'll start advertising as we can. Um, thank you all so much. I can't say it again. Um, Tomorrow, we will share the recording with everyone so you can send it out and all the things to friends, families, other things. So thank you all so much. Greg, thank you. Allison, thank you. Um, Derek, thank you. Gabriella, thank you so much. Um, we very much appreciate it. So have a good night, everyone. Hope you enjoy yourselves.